Hi, I'm William Tuchia, and I'm the current Web and Digital Content Coordinator here at Libraries Hot of Noor and Hot of Noor District Council. I was born in Bangkok, Thailand, and immigrated over to New Zealand at a young age, where I found myself moving around the Lower North Island and the east coast of Australia, until finally deciding to settle in Hot of Noor for the last years of forever. This is where I attended one of the top two high schools that a small town of 20,000 people has to offer, Hot of Noor College. There I studied the typical STEM classes, but leaned towards technological design in the last year or two, which led me down the route that I'm on now. My first job after high school was as a digital printing press operator in Palmerston North. This was a job where I learned invaluable workplace skills, such as the importance of paying attention to fine detail and problem-solving complex situations. Not to mention some of the other qualities that my colleagues find mildly annoying, yet entertaining, like my slight OCD tendencies. Fast forward a year later to find myself back in home in the big LVN, live-in, with my current job where I am blessed to work with some of the most inter interesting minds I have ever come across. We have such a diverse comms team who bring all different skills, complementing each other and working to our great strengths. So I'm going to touch on five main points during this presentation. The points being the historical context of Koha, how I learned to use Koha, a bit on HTML, where you can go for support, and where to next. Koha within my organisation. Koha was originally created in 1999 for Hot Library Trust, a three-branch library system, which of course is now Libraries Hot under Hot District Council. Katipo Communications created a new system to replace their library management system that was deemed not to be compliant with the year 2000 date change. They were interested in developing a new system rather than purchase another product, one which was affordable, met their and their users' needs, and used a web browser interface. Consistent with many other business applications created in the open source model at the time, Katipo made use of other open source components, MySQL for its uh, relational database management system, Perl for programming its business logic and interfaces, the Linux operating system, and the Apache web server. These technology components were well suited to mid-level business applications. Since its original version, these basic components have remained in place, though the program code has been rewritten and radically expanded during its 14 years of development. Upon its completion and implementation, Katipo and Horofanoa Library Trust decided to release Koha as open source, so that its ongoing development might be more sustainable should other libraries want to use and improve the software. Koha, in the Māori language of the indigenous population in New Zealand, means gift. By making the software freely available, Horofanoa Library Trust wanted to ensure the subsequent modifications and additions by other organisations were open source as well. Benefiting all users, this remains the philosophy of the real koha to this day. Library Tauruwhenua is still very proud and committed to koha. How I learned how to use koha. I spent the first few weeks in my new role getting to know the lay of the land, as you do. In the first few weeks, I became familiar with learning how the old OPAC works, then I learned we were in the midst of upgrading it. The old OPAC works was perfectly functional, but it was wordy, clunky, not so modern and vibrant as we would have liked it to be. It wasn't easy to navigate either. It had basic library catalogue functions. It did its job, but it was time for a revamp. Research studies continue to report that users have great difficulties because their design does not incorporate sufficient understanding of searching behaviour. Wilson and Given discovered the, that users experience difficulties using OPACs. They tend to lack the basic skills required to perform a search and don't always use the facilities and features offered. Internet search engines pose another challenge because users generally prefer Google to conduct their searches. The OPAC is important at all to help us find library resources efficiently. Catalyst, our council team and libraries team, mainly our collections manager Larissa and libraries manager Wendy Fraser, collaborated on developing the new look OPAC. They designed the graphic, colours, content, etc. and Catalyst updated the OPAC. The new features in improved the appearance and overall ex user experience. Some of the new highlights included a custom slider of resources, which allows librarians to choose which books they wish to showcase, 
customizable content blocks now bring attention to useful library collections, such as ebooks and online resources, and a jump to opening hours widget answers that most frequent question. The navigation and search bar have also been updated in both look and usability. So a lot of the hard work was done by the time I came along. I attended Catalyst training and learned about a lot of the back-end functions. The OPAC was basically totally new to me. One of the main responsibilities is creating and managing content for other library websites. And we were at the start of a big project developing Kitty Horofanua, a community-built digital library of arts, cultural and heritage resources for and about Horofanua, New Zealand. So as, so as well as learning about the OPAC, there was a huge learning curve developing workplace skills such as time management and balancing slash prioritizing workload, as I have had a great support from Larissa and Wendy, who had seen the OPAC project through from the start and who are mentors for me really. Using the demo site, I could learn on the job, practicing and of course making mistakes and learning from them without going live. I was told to go ahead and make mistakes because that's how to learn and how to come up with ways to improve the final product. Although I backed up my work constantly by archiving all the strands of HTML, so if I did make a mistake, I could easily amend it myself. Good old work does come in handy. Looking back, I think there was only one case where I somehow managed to break everything so much that I had to swallow my pride and get the life slash job saving team at Catalyst to revert the OPAC back to an older save. HTML isn't that bad. In order to conquer HTML, you must first understand what it is, where it came from, and why it is needed. HTML is an acronym that stands for Hypertext Markup Language. Essentially, it is the standard format used to create web pages, web apps, and documents. This is a series of code that could be described as a computer's language, and is typically written in text file, then saved as HTML. When viewed on a web browser, the code is translated into the eye-friendly blend of text and other media. The first instance of HTML was created in 1989 by Tim Berners-Lee as a solution to the issue that the organisation he was working for had. His organisation being CERN, which is a European laboratory for particle physics in Geneva, Switzerland. Particle physics laboratories all across the world would constantly be sharing data with each other, but this was a tedious job. Tim Berners-Lee came up with the ultimate solution called HTML. He had created a way to pull everyone's information together from all different ends of the globe, even being able to link text within the files themselves. 31 years later, and almost 1.7 billion websites worldwide now use some form of HTML. These websites slash programs that I'm going to mention really helped me with my everyday usage and even experimenting with HTML. The first program I used was Adobe Dreamweaver. I must admit, it wasn't love at first sight, much like a lot of the programs that Adobe have, as they can come across as super complicated and have more buttons than you could ever dream of using. Which I didn't know could be a thing coming from someone who supposedly likes to press them. But after a few days of keyboard smacking and button abuse, it all starts to come together and make sense. The best part about Dreamweaver is the fact that you can perform live view coding this was especially helpful to myself in particular, as I'm a visual learner, so being able to immediately see what lines of jargon I was mashing into the keyboard represented was invaluable. W3Schools.com is a great place to spend some spare time learning the ins and outs of HTML. It offers plenty of examples and even the ability to practice within the website. I have what feels like one million tabs from this website saved in my help folder. And the last on my list is the one and only Professor Google. With there being almost 2 billion different websites in the world, it is highly likely that someone else is facing or faced a similar issue to the one you're having and has already cracked the code. Support. Each of us has a role to play. I have found that relationships are hugely important and I can see how the combination of sound business decision making and focus on the needs and wants of the library, including the open source philosophy, is crucial. I took part in training with Catalyst. They have very experienced instructors and a portfolio of courses to help you make the most of open source technology. It was a great overview and start for me, building up my confidence. The help desk. 
Always found the help disk a good source of information, no matter how silly I feel my questions are. The Koha Wiki. I do tend to check the Koha Wiki before a call to the help desk, just to see if anyone else has had the same problem. It is a huge wealth of info and advice from experienced people. The Koha Mailing List. I'm part of the Koha Mailing List, which is a great place to be. You can keep up to date with changes, updates, and any news there. You can even join up if you're only a lurker. Hang around and read what everyone is saying. There are people who have been around for varying lengths of time and have different areas of expertise, and communicating with these people is key to learning both how to use the software and how to participate. The Libraries and the Librarians Librarians and free open source software have lots in common. They both believe that information should be freely accessible to everyone, and they're both all about communities. I find that looking at other libraries, their OPAC was useful as a guide whilst always having in mind what our library's needs were. It's always good to talk to someone who is using it and let them show you the inner workings and how they use the system. My librarian colleagues have brought a lot of institutional knowledge and have supported me with great advice, moral support and lots of cups of coffee. I will thank them one day by actually using my library card. I think it's essential that librarians are actively involved and don't just leave development to the developers and vendors. I kind of see myself as a bridge between developers and the librarians I work with to ensure we keep in mind the end user who we serve. The future. Now that the OPAC is in place and we have the pleasure of promoting its use to the public, our users, my role for the future will be keeping it up to date, maintenance and keeping the information available relevant. I work alongside a team of librarians who are experts in all they do and are in touch with our customers' needs. Together we have a pretty strategic plan of how we can keep the OPEC relevant to the library user. Networks allow different users from outside the library remote access to the R OPEC. These remote users may face problems that differ from the OPEC's users in the library. They may not be comfortable with the computer technology and may not be familiar with the OPEC of the library. Libraries should offer different support services than they would provide to on-site users. Libraries should be responsive to the needs of remote users. They, the users need technical advice as well as special instruction aids, and guides lead them to the information they want to retrieve. This is even more relevant now as we are in the midst of an unprecedented global pandemic. Moving to open source was philosophically a good fit for Hodafnor Library Trust. It has also been a good financial and practical decision. But most importantly, it helps us to put the end user and the people we serve at the heart of decisions we make as an organisation. Finally, the woman who had the foresight to push the development of Koha, Jo Ransom, quoted Linus Torvalds from an interview with Stephen Vaughan Nichols for a Hewlett Packard publication. He had this to say about software development. The other thing that people seem to get wrong is that they think they have to write code is what matters. No, even if you write 100% of the code, and even if you are the best programmer in the world and will never need any help with the project at all, the thing that really matters is the users of the code. The code itself is unimportant. The project is only as useful as the people actually find it. Open source projects only survive if a community builds up around the product to ensure its continual improvement. Koha is stronger than ever now because it is supported by an active community of developers, librarians and vendors who actually talk to each other. This is probably the biggest thing I've learned so far, to talk to each other. <laughs>